This is a talk, Agile Drupal 8 Builds, Doing the Most Without PHP. This was a talk that David and I sort of had been chatting a lot about Drupal 8 being released and sort of both working at Pantheon and seeing a lot of our customers and partners make and start to develop Drupal 8 sites, sort of trying to think about what kind of development practices and development patterns are going to make the most sense for this new CMS that we've both been doing Drupal a very long time, and we've seen a lot of different kinds of ways to make sites. And I would sort of put forward today that building a Drupal 8 site is going to be a different kind of process for developers and site builders than doing uh, in previous versions of Drupal. So this is a talk, it's you know, not the most advanced talk I think either of us have given, but I think it has a lot of interesting components and is very much a sort of action-oriented, example-oriented attempt to sort of put out there a sort of philosophy that we feel is appropriate for building Drupal 8 sites and to sort of talk about some of the challenges that we face sort of doing some of the own construction uh, with that. So in terms of introductions, my name is Matt Cheney. I work on the magical platform that's Pantheon. I've been doing that for about five years, which means I have a lot of experience obviously on the server side, but also actually working with a lot of people here in this room and at this conference who use us to actually build the websites of their dreams and the dreams of their friends, families, and followers. I also very much believe in the power of site building, in the power of people who aren't extremely technical, who aren't gonna write a lot of code to leverage open source technologies. That I think that we've been building something very great in the Drupal community over the last 10 years, but I think it needs to be increasing and accessible to other people who aren't technical as, you know, sort of coders. That we have the power to build GUI interfaces to do a lot of things that previously you would have to write code. So to that end, I absolutely love the work Earl Miles had done both with views and with panels. Um, huge advocate of panels as a sort of solution for site building and spent a lot of time uh, with David Snowpeck and others building a technology solution called Panoply that I'll talk about today, which is basically an attempt to bundle a lot of functionality together, to provide an out of the box, really great drag and drop building experience for sites. And it's the kind of thing that I had seen a lot of folks find success in actually doing. And you know, I think the Drupal 8 will even empower stuff bigger, and I'm excited to be here today to share sort of my uh, understanding of working with Drupal 8 sites and to take some questions and start that conversation. And uh, I'm David Strauss. Uh, I've worked on the design of Drupal 8's configuration management system, uh, and my real goal with all of this stuff is to harmonize uh, the easy and tough use cases of Drupal, where um, historically we've had Thing, uh, situations where you would either do a completely different method for doing the really complex advanced way and you would have some sort of basic way that serious site designers would look down on and uh, I think that we can really harmonize those approaches in ways where you can build professional sites and you can configure them through the GUI. Uh, and you can deliver things faster to customers, faster to users of Drupal. This is how we stay competitive against projects like WordPress. It's also how we stay competitive against everything from up the stack uh, for SaaS products uh, like Weebly, et cetera, that allow you to configure your way to a site, uh, and down the stack against frameworks uh, that are based entirely on you pulling up a shell and coding. So that this is a talk sort of about getting back to basics with respect to building websites. That Drupal is, at its core, a CMS. It's designed to manage and display content, and it does that increasingly well. That you can use Drupal for other things than just content management. Folks do often with great success. But I think that the kinds of problems that I'm interested in solving and interested in helping other people solve are sort of information problems. That before I was in Drupal doing technology work, I was a librarian, and a lot of those kind of problems I think are very analogous to problems in tech. That we're better as people if we know more things, if we can access more information, if we can share, and I think that sort of open source tools like Drupal help us to accomplish that. And after sort of 10 plus years of very serious Drupal development, we have some really great tools to use that there's a lot of genius has been put into this framework and a lot of people and use cases have been solved in meaningful ways that we can all benefit from today to accomplish our work. And I think that's the job of many of us in the room that we're building sites for people who have to share information. We're helping to them to manage their content and let other people know about it. 
and that we want to find the best approaches for it, which is probably one of the reasons that you're in this talk today. But one of the crazy things about Drupal is that you can do all this other crazy stuff with it. Like, it's not just about, um, you know, simple content creation, that you have all of these tools, increasing tools at your disposal, and you can make wild sites with Drupal. And I've done a bunch of crazy stuff with Drupal. I've done, you know, Drupal 5 Arabic sites and USB keys that get shipped off to do, you know, sort of weird stuff, make crazy internets for a bunch of people to, you know, share files. Even made a website for donuts for my friends just to, like, make, you know, crazy maps happen. And I think in each of those cases, you had these really sort of complicated use cases that, you know, you sort of had to choose, in many cases, very weird pathways to actually accomplish, you know, sort of common tasks. And I think that's one of the really crazy things about Drupal is that because you could do everything, which is awesome, it can sometimes take away from sort of the base functionality. Because while in this room we're all building different kinds of sites for different kinds of people, many of the structures and functionalities of those sites are actually very, very similar. You know, we have a blog system, we have a commenting system, like we have uh, some sort of image gallery. Like these are common uh, use cases that as Drupal, you can get and build them, but you can build them in a lot of different ways. And I think that is actually and can be very confusing for people, not only as they start out to build these kinds of systems, but as they actually maintain and support them over the long run, which is a problem sort of in terms of web, web hosting and web platform work we see a lot. So it's 2016. I want to build like a basic website with content. Um, some of this stuff should be easy, should be really straightforward. Um, but in many cases, I think it's, it's not. That if you look at some of the websites, and we've seen a lot of these things, Drupal 6, Drupal 7 sites, we're talking sites that have hundreds of contributed modules from dozens of different developers that have a lot of different crazy releases, and that people sort of start off projects really just like throwing code at the problem. And I think that that um, contributes to a lot of sort of, you know, cruft and, and difficulty and maintenance going forward. So, and apologies to Emma Goldman for putting her on this slide um, at a business conference, but um, I wanted to throw out a radical idea here that when we're talking about development and we're talking about starting a Drupal 8 site to actually build a website for someone, that I think that I'd like to propose that you start with and maybe even end with just using the Drupal 8 core module set. That you'll still end up writing some code. You'll use your Twig templates to do some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Some cases to do actually very complicated uh, and custom things. And you do may end up using a contrib project or, or two as part of your work. But I think that there is a real value in trying to keep the development work that you do as close to a sort of Drupal core solution as possible. I don't actually think this was true, and I'll sort of explain that in previous versions of Drupal, but I do think that in Drupal 8, uh, it's true. Because when we talk about writing custom code, writing custom PHP, I just put to you, I mean, isn't the 237,000 lines of PHP in Drupal 8 enough for your project? <laughs> do you need more code? Um, do you want to support more code? Do you want to maintain more code? Um, I mean, in some cases, yes, of course you do. But I think that for the first time in you know, the history of Drupal, I feel we have what is actually a complete content management system. That we can actually roll out Drupal 8 and make a real website that looks and feels and does the kinds of stuff that users expect in 2016. It also has the advantage in the case of Drupal 8 core that it's the code base, the project, that's actually, that has the highest quality code in the entire ecosystem. Better than any contri most you know, contrib projects and uh, it has the smartest and some of the most dedicated people working on it. And I don't want to, I mean, I, Contrib is wonderful and it's an amazing part of the Drupal ecosystem, but there is this sort of magic that happens with Drupal core that it is this unified development process, that it has a set of very explicit standards for how things are developed. And you have this very like regular release cycle that like on any, any given Wednesday, you could get a new version of Drupal and it can get better stuff along with that, security, bug fixes, features like that. And with solutions like Pantheon or Drush or other places, you can just hit one button to update your core, you get all of that value as part of just a regular process. And I think that that's actually something that as developers, in terms of building, we can gain a lot of advantage starting from that point. But as we maintain these sites over the long run, we can have a lot of sustainability with that kind of solution. Because this is true in Drupal 8, but it was not something that was true in Drupal 7 or before. Here's some usage statistics just between Drupal core itself and views as a contributed project. 
And if you look at this, sort of 80% of all Drupal 7 websites had to uh, you know, install the views uh, module in order to actually do any of the things that they wanted to, or to do things that they wanted to do on their site. That, you know, and I'd also question of the you know, 20% that weren't using views, sort of what exactly those sites, sites were doing. I mean, maybe awesome stuff for sure, but the, uh, you know, the idea that you needed to have contrib, you absolutely had to have contrib to, to build sites. And um, this you know, creates a lot of problems, honestly, in, the, in terms of uh, development and maintenance. You know, there's some clear discoverability issues when we're talking about getting new people into the ecosystem to say, hey, you should use Drupal. So they go out and download Drupal and they try to do it and they don't have views, so they don't know what really to do. And they'll eventually find it, many do, but many also give up and that's frustrating, obviously, because we put a lot of time and energy into making Drupal great. The same thing is also true in terms of actually maintaining your site. If you have you know, one, two, three, or four contrib projects, suddenly your development practice is now hinged not only around core's release cycle and core's practices, but also those contrib projects as well. And you put some crazy Legos together to try to make sites. You try to make something really cool, but you know, up until Drupal 8, it was really hard to get something that was really aw something awesome out of the box. And I think sort of as software consumers, people who are you know, using website technologies, building stuff, we want something really awesome out of the box. We want a really good first time user experience for developers, for site builders, for you know, end users, for everybody. That the internet's grown a lot and I think one of the challenges that Drupal faces is that it is a very customized kind of tool set and it's increasingly competing against SaaS sort of web solutions that um, allow you to log in and have really fantastic user experiences to build you know, Facebook profiles or Yelp pages or you know, these kinds of, of, of other kinds of things. And that when you looked at something like Drupal 6, Drupal 7, that sort of first time user experience was very lacking. That you didn't have these like core components as part of the solution, you had to find other stuff. And that even with inside of the core product, like in Drupal 6 and 7, you had these what seemed to be obvious pathways, like I want polls, so I have a poll module, or I want blogs, so I have a blog module, or I want a forum, so I have a forum module, that were ultimately inadequate solutions for many cases for those projects. That you, know, you wanted something like flag module that you could do a lot more stuff with, or blog, you wanted to build up your own content type and list it with views. These are things that you know, made people who are first time developers very frustrated. And I think part of growing the community and the ecosystem is having solutions that actually get to a point where I can start with it, I can be successful with it, and I can deploy a site, because I think that's sort of what we all want. So this is something that I tried to do uh, with some other folks in Drupal 7, um, doing a sort of distribution of Drupal called Panoply which um, I quite love. It uh, started out as a project with the uh, University of California at Berkeley to build a sort of distribution of Drupal for university sites. But it quickly came you know, to be that like, while well, there was some cool university functionality we had in there, a lot of the sort of generalized starting point con uh, technology was actually applicable well beyond that. That you know, the idea with Panoply was that we could provide a sort of single foundation, a single out of the box product that you could download and install, and it was Drupal, it had a lot of cool stuff in it, but it was one thing, and when you, it came out a new version, you could update it and get all of those updates. And it was a good foundation for site building. It had a lot of really awesome tools. And it sort of looked like this. You know, we had Drupal 7 as a core sort of core stack. We had some modules on top, and then we actually sort of created these different like pieces of functionality, you know, like responsive layouts and media integration and administrative dashboard. WYSIWYG and stuff like this. And the important thing was that like, none of these solutions I would say were like A plus kind of things, but they were all pretty good. And they were all extendable in ways that actually helped developers. But it let them start much higher up the stack. And I think that's one lesson sort of from working in technology for the last decade is that when we're doing development, it's important to try to like, you know, stand on the shoulders of other people who have done stuff before. That you don't need to reinvent the wheel. That you're doing your best work when you're leveraging other people's talents. And I think that's sort of part of what I think is awesome in Drupal 8 and part of what Panoply is trying to do in Drupal 7. Because things like selecting even modules to start with on a site could be very frustrating. That like, you know, in many cases you would need to have dozens of modules on a Drupal 6 site to build a lot of the kind of functionality you wanted. And that because different modules, you know, had, you know, competitive kind of solutions and that integrating them together was a little bit of a challenge, it was hard. 
So part of what we did in Panoply was to actually pick the modules that we thought were really good and actually sort of put them together. And that was important because there are things that you would like do in Drupal, like you would like want to like make like a link or something, or you want to make a date field, but you didn't know about link module and you didn't know about date module. So you just make a text field and like just like slap in the information into that field, but it wouldn't validate, it wouldn't display right, and it would be very frustrating. You know, and then in terms of adding these things, it wasn't just about putting these modules and turning them on. It was about harmonizing them with the permission systems and the roles we had. It was about tracking key patches across the modules for review. And it was making sure everything worked well together. It was also important for Panoply, we wanted to build these like site building features, things that I think in Drupal 8, you know, we're gonna have very nice analogies uh, to sort of going forward. That this is the panel's IP, let you do some drag and drop stuff. And there was, you know, a lot of other functionality that we did sort of using blocks. Uh, with Drupal 8, we have a much better block system. We have a lot of these kind of functionalities already baked in. We also made it probably an administration system that looks a lot like some of the Drupal 8 stuff as well, as well as the WYSIWYG system sort of that uh, you know, came out of the box. Because as a content management system, solving core content management problems, having a WYSIWYG is like a necessary component of that solution. And it wasn't until Drupal 8 that we actually had that solution. And that, I think, in my view, was a really big gap. So I don't want to go too, too far down. There's a lot of features that we had like built out as part of this, things like responsive layouts that Drupal 8 does as well that um, are important to what we're sort of trying to do. But this is the kind of stuff that I think that, you know, I thought about a lot in the Drupal 8 cycle and spent a lot of time trying to build because having that sort of out-of-the-box solution was really important. And it got a lot of pickup. People were excited about using it. It wasn't like, you know, everyone using it like views, but we had a lot of people who saw Panoply as a good starting place because it had that foundation. And I put to you that, like, that was really awesome and it was good work and there was a lot of nice patterns that came out of it. But making that all happen was really difficult. And I think that, like, when you sort of talk about developing a site where you're molding a lot of modules together, getting all of that to work together can be really hard. This is the uh, info file from our, like, WYSIWYG integration where we're talking about, like, 15 or something different dependency modules that all need to be put together to do things like handling image resizing and media integration and security and all this other stuff. And that, you know, that was a lot of work and something that I think, you know, a lot of developers struggle to do. They're reinventing the wheel and not leveraging other stuff by trying to, like, figure out this recipe. And I think that that's, um, you know, not so great. So what I would say is sort of, you know, to wrap that kind of, this kind of section up, I think there were some lessons I learned for trying to build an out-of-the-box solution in Drupal 7 that I think are very relevant to why Drupal 8 is the right solution to start with as a sort of core product. Uh, the first is that, you know, having a big development core team is really important. That at Panoply, we had about half a dozen people who would help, which was awesome. But, you know, this limited the ability of velocity of features and, you know, integrations just because you don't have as many folks. We also had some really serious challenges dealing with actually putting configuration into code and um, you know, getting something like that working. That it wasn't just about you know, making sure we had a feature that bundled the config, but allowing it to be easily overextended and, and modified as it sort of went on. Um, we also had really you know, interesting challenges dealing with code quality and structure varying across projects. That not all contrib projects were the same. Many of them had different weird release cycles, and they could change based on the release, which could, of course, come out at any time. There also was a real sort of difficulty in centralizing this work. I think this is actually one of the problems in the Drupal ecosystem is that you have so many modules and so many fiefdoms of development that actually getting people to sort of work and harmonize together can be really tricky. That you know you have a bunch of different issue queues you have to deal with, so it's hard to sort of get people together. But sort of to get into Drupal 8, that this, there's a lot of hope that Drupal 8 solves these problems, that having you know, that sort of base solution you can roll with can be really awesome. And that you know, I think a lot of what Panoply is trying to do, Drupal 8 already does out of the box, and that is fantastic. So what does it do? Of course, you know, instead of having just a small development team, we actually have a uh, you know, whole core team. Oh, sorry, people or not. Okay, sorry. This is blow up for the thing. If you want to control slides. There we go. All going down. So same thing in Drupal 7. Sorry. Um, <laughs> that like having a bigger core development team is way better. That like having like the WYSIWYG supported by like a like group of much larger people helps, you know, everybody sort of contribute and extend to that. 
having kind of configuration management in Drupal 8 core makes actually bundling and like setting your, your configuration be really, really easy. That code quality and structure is actually improved greatly in Drupal 8 because you have Drupal core standards that are imposed uh, you know, pretty rigorously on all the code that goes in. And you have that centralized issue queue that actually has all of the different you know, people working together. So you could easily find bugs and track project uh, patches and this kind of thing. And that you have this out of the box experience that's really awesome. That you know, um, I think you know, there's a lot of things Drupal 8 can do out of the box and I encourage you to sort of go that way. Because this is sort of the build methodology that we're trying to present here. That you know, we want, when you're actually doing a site, I'd like you to consider the idea of beginning development with just Drupal 8 core. Build as much as possible. Spend as much time building out your solution in that core solution as possible. Do add a contrib project or two, and maybe custom code if you absolutely have to, but think very critically about that. Because that's code that you're gonna be supporting and maintaining over the course of your project and handing off to anyone who maintains it afterwards. The, I already see some people noticing this, but this is probably the most important slide in the deck, which is that um, since Drupal 8 is so capable of doing so many of the things for site building out of the box, that it's really worth revisiting to see whether you can do it out of core rather than making your first visit for figuring out Drupal 8 uh, to the contrib repository. Yeah, there was, it actually was a sort of chatting with someone prior to this and they had talked about their Drupal 6 site where they had had 166 modules on the site and they moved over to Drupal 8 and I think they ended up with 12 modules uh, on the site. And that's huge because that, the maintenance kind of burden on that is way less. That I've had plenty of frustrations where I have a site with a ton of modules and I'll do like a drush mass update of all the modules and stuff will break. And I don't even know what breaks. I have to like sort of manually go in and be like, update this, did it break? Update this, okay, it didn't break. When I did this other one at the same time, it did. Total disaster. This is a much, I think, cleaner approach and something that'll create more stable and sustainable code. Because the Drupal 8 core process and update process is very well tested, well supported. Some of the contrib space may not be as much. So, this is sort of where we're going. This is sort of the overview of, of that kind of philosophy. I think sort of to get into some of the details, I'll turn to David in a minute, we sort of actually decided, we built a few sort of Drupal 8 projects, but we decided to actually build an actual Drupal 8 website to sort of see, could we put this methodology into practice? How do we feel about that? So we're both uh, fans of like doing crazy projects, of course, and so we thought we'd do like a Drupal clone of Kickstarter. Uh, which is a you know crowdfunding kind of uh, kind of website. You post a project and people support it and they get some benefits for it and, and this kind of thing. And importantly, uh, this allowed us to pick a set of criteria for building the site that wasn't just designed uh, from the beginning to be easily satisfiable with Drupal 8. Um, it meant that we would have to solve some hard use cases, we'd have to run into a few walls, uh, and we'd ultimately have to figure out how to solve them either with core or contrib, uh, and all, um, given the basis of this presentation, all without, uh, with avoiding writing any PHP. And so we had some problems and content sort of solutions we had to deal with. We needed to have some user you know, profiles with relatively rich information about each person who was like proposing projects or, or supporting projects. We had to actually have the projects themselves that were relatively complicated data models. Um, they included some videos for people to talk about the projects they wanted to be fund. There was a blog to talk about stuff. There was categorization of the projects, so there was some discoverability. We had perks where if you back something, you actually could get you know, some benefit, and then we actually need to let people back stuff and pay uh, for that as well, which is you know, sort of part of the Kickstarter kind of tool set. And it's a complicated site. They have a lot of developers working on Kickstarter. Like, and we didn't build like an exact clone, but like, this, is the, this is a real use case you might actually need to do for somebody. And beyond just the actual content, there actually is this functionality that needs to happen that like, people actually do need to actually submit a project and have, there needs to be some sort of review or you know, sort of process around it. You know, people need to be able to post a blog with some sort of like, you know, usability to it. You actually need to be defined to fulfill perks as project owners in a secure way where you're not like, also added, adding perks to other projects. People need to be able to sign up, you need to be able to search, and you actually do that backing and post a video using like, actual you know, secure practices of posting stuff online. But we did build a site. This is uh, our site in question. It had that article blog system, had a project submission workflow of sorts. It had a project categorization system, project pilks and fulfillment, let people back, let people pay, had user accounts, um, and we had this uh, twig-based theme uh, from Zymphonies that we found that we sort of adapted to make this all work with the block system, which was really great. So this is the kind of thing I think you could be asked to do for your clients and your customers, and I'll uh, turn it over to David to sort of walk us through that build and some of the issues we faced with it. 
So this is mostly a success story, and then we'll go into some of the caveats right after, uh, where there were some areas where we had to uh, wade through a little bit of mud more than we think is really ideal for the experience. Um, so uh, in the spirit of starting with core, uh, we started with Drupal 8, uh, just pure Drupal, uh, installed it, um, and uh, getting the installed copy is, of course, the first step to uh, success with Drupal 8. Uh, but right after that, um, Wow, this copy is a little small for me to actually see, so I might have to turn around a little bit. Um, so one of the first things that we did is um, we created a project content type. The backbone of any kind of Kickstarter clone is that you have projects. Uh, so uh, by creating a project content type, we would allow people to do things like posting the description of the project. And one of the things that uh, Kickstarter requires these days is listing the risks associated with the project. Uh, now, um, Drupal 6 and even Drupal 7 a little bit, um, this can be a little uh, challenging to do, especially if you want to offer formatting for this stuff. But in Drupal 8, it's as simple as adding a second uh, long text field. Uh, to uh, allow people to create a risk section. And by default, that has a GUI interface. Uh, you're able to uh, add bullet points. You're able to add images. Uh, all of this is handled as part of core. Uh, so we're actually really far along already in allowing people to post projects to the site, format their presentation of it. Um, uh, and uh, we have a few more things that we want to do with this project, like allowing people to post videos, but we'll get into that later. Um, the next thing that really is the backbone of a Kickstarter style site is offering perks for projects, where if you give $100 or more to this project, you get you know, perk X and Y. Uh, if you give $1,000, you get these additional things. Um, uh, we can't quite support people paying for them out of core, but the first thing that we can do is we can start looking at how uh, we allow people to create this. Uh, and what we did is we first created a perk content type. Um, out of the box that includes a title for it and a body that you can include bullet points of what you get. Um, and uh, at this point, we, um, uh, in terms of very simple site building with just core, uh, we have, we've installed it and we have two content types. Uh, the things that we still need to accomplish to get this sort of uh, Kickstarter clone going is uh, we have to be able to link perks to projects. People should only be able to create perks for their own projects. Uh, they, um, People should be able to buy those perks uh, from a project uh, that they're browsing, uh, from the listing of those perks on the project page. Uh, and you, people should be able to post a video that's showing a preview of their project. Um, so uh, we can actually still keep um, trudging forward with just core at this point. Um, we can create a view to list projects. Um, what this means is um, we go into the kind of structure of the site, we create a view. Uh, some of the basic options for creating a view are that it's for content types, and in this case, we select uh, just uh, project content types. So out of the box, this view is just going to list all projects, or sorry, perks. Uh, yeah, perks. Um, so, um, no, wait, wait. sorry, I'm just getting confused about the relationship. Yes, this view is to list projects so that we can associate them with the perks. Uh, so out of the box, this is going to list all projects site-wide. Uh, but what we actually want to do is, um, if you can quite see it in there, uh, the name of this view is My Projects because you should only be able to create pro uh, perks for your own projects. Um, so after creating this view, we have to do a couple more things before we can actually make it so that perks can be associated with someone's project. Uh, we can create a conditional filter uh, on uh, the view where we filter um, for only the projects that that person owns. Uh, so that means that if you created a project before, you're going to be able to see that project as one of your options for uh, creating a perk. Uh, and then um, down in validation, uh, there's a validator that uh, you would have to have edit access to that user that owns the project in order to be able to uh, actually um, add perks to that project. And this prevents someone from possibly changing the parameters of the view uh, and um, introducing a perk for a project they don't own. Uh, this also would mean that admins could create perks for projects that they don't own, but that's okay because they're admins. Uh, so uh, we've configured a couple options in here. Um, and then the last thing we have to do is actually make it available as an entity reference view because out of the box when you create a view, you only have a couple options, a page and a block. But if you want it to be able to be showing as options on something else, then uh, you have to create it as an entity reference. And then that creates converts this base view into an entity reference. Entity reference um, in Drupal means a relationship between uh, one node to another. 
Um, so now what we've done is we've created the foundation for us providing an option on another node to uh, associate that node with one of your own projects. Um, uh, additionally, uh, if you're doing an entity reference, because when Drupal does an entity reference field, uh, it, uh, it doesn't autocomplete things, so you can type in only a few letters of the name of something and pull it up. Uh, so you have to specify how, what it's searching on. In this case, we're just gonna have it search by title, but we have to actually actively configure that. So what this means now is that we have a view that we can make available as a widget uh, on another node that will list only the projects that the owner owns uh, and allow them to do a little autocomplete to pull up the projects that they own uh, and then associate it with a, and, and then we'll, we're gonna be associating it with perks. Uh, so the next step um, is pretty straightforward for this. We add another field to perks uh, that, um, that is um, content. Um, it, this just creates the basic reference and then we can configure that to use this view that we created as an entity reference. Um, and what this now does for perks is um, in addition to having a title for the perk and a description of the perk, uh, there's now a field that is an autocomplete that allows you to, um, to link that perk to one of your projects. So anyone can now go in and create a perk for one of their existing projects. The, um, but this isn't the end. Uh, we, we have the perks in the system now, but we want people to be able to actually see them uh, next to a project, so we have to go through a few more steps. Uh, we're gonna create a new view um, as a block uh, view uh, that is going to list the perks for a specific project. Um, and uh, again, we hop back into this kind of conditional filter, uh, and we, um, this time, instead of filtering it by the current user, uh, what we do is we filter it by the, um, the content ID in that reference field. So what that means is that every perk now that gets created is associated with a project. And we can do this filter in a way, even just through this GUI, in a way where we pull up every single perk that is associated with the project currently being viewed. Um, and once that is uh, completed, um, uh, once we say that we want to filter by the actual referenced project, uh, we can go in and set the default to be the current content ID. And when you pull up a node on Drupal, um, that is the current content ID that you can filter by. So let's say someone pulls up a project page. Um, it's project ID 2 in the system. Uh, and then we want to find all the perks for project ID 2. And here what we can do is we can set up this filter where we pull up every, pro uh, every perk that is associated with a project ID 2. Uh, and then having done this, um, we've created a block in the system. Um, this actually used to take an enormous amount of work in earlier versions of Drupal to get this far. You would basically have, we, we, would, have, we would have already pulled out the PHP at this point. Um, but now we have a block uh, and we can hop right over to the block system in Drupal 8. Um, now this is a bit different than the experience you might have expected on Drupal 7 or earlier because on those earlier releases we sort of listed all the blocks and then there were unused ones at the bottom and then you could assign them somewhere. But blocks in Drupal 8 that aren't used anywhere uh, are actually uh, hidden and you have to click place block before they'll pull up the list. So if we click place block, um, uh, in the case of the default Bartik theme, um, the sidebar second is the right sidebar on any kind of layout. And by default it has nothing in it, so it kind of collapses. But if you put something in it, it will appear. So we can place a block. Uh, we can do the block we just created, which is perks by project. Uh, which automatically shows the correct perks for a project. Um, and then we can restrict it so that it only appears on project pages. So now um, what we have is um, a setup where when you view a project, in the right-hand bar of that project, it will show a listing of all perks associated with that project. So uh, at this point, um, uh, it actually took quite a few steps, but it was all possible through core uh, to link perks to projects and list them on the project page. Uh, now, uh, I sort of picked this as a stopping point because this is where we sort of hit a wall with core. Uh, because we wanted to do two things that core doesn't support directly right now, at least in a really good way, um, which is accepting payment for the perks and supporting videos on projects. 
Uh, you can kind of hack those things in. Like maybe you could put something in the template where you hop over to PayPal with a form to pay for something, or you could allow people to just drop in an arbitrary URL for a YouTube video. But we wanted to provide a better experience. We wanted to validate that data. We wanted to make it where um, it was responsive, where like when someone pulls up a project on their phone, it's rendering the video the right way for them. And if on the desktop, it's rendering the video the right way for them. Uh, and the same thing for payments. We wanted a flexible thing where people could pick currency for their payments and they could pick the actual provider that they were processing the payment through. Um, so we'll start with the easier one, uh, which is um, supporting for videos. Uh, so I show the two modules we pull down here. You can do this in the GUI on Drupal as well, on Drupal 8, uh, if you have right access to the file system. Uh, this, I'm just showing it here, doing it with Drush, which is a way that you can do it with the command line. Often this is a really nice and fast way to do it because you don't actually have to download it to your desktop. You can just browse to, uh, you can just connect up uh, to Drush on a local or remote copy and then tell it to pull down the module. And Drush also pulls down the dependencies for you too, which is quite nice. Um, some of these modules might have two or three other ones that they require as well. So here I've pulled down two modules. I've pulled down video embed field and, um, and payment. Uh, video embed field also um, is showing one of the other great things that's happened um, a little bit in Drupal 7 and a lot in Drupal 8, which is better extension points for how modules are actually extending the tools that you have on the site. It used to be in the old era of say Drupal or early, a lot of Drupal 7 and especially Drupal 6 and before, that if someone wanted to extend a node, uh, like with an edit form or a rendering thing, they would write a module and then they would do this thing called decorator pattern where they would basically have a hook that they would alter the form or the view of it on the fly and it would be very unreliable for integrating various modules because they might be in an order you can't control. Um, they might have their own individual settings for how, what node types they're on or other things like that. Uh, and now with fields, rather than trying to push it all the way onto the form, uh, something can write a widget like um, payment form or, uh, or this video uh, field and they can, they can get added wherever you want in the form to whatever content types you want um, and with the uh, visualization of it that you want. Um, and uh, so having added the, um, the video field, we can now add a video embed to our, uh, our project content type. And then we can hop, uh, we can configure that. In this case, I've just allowed YouTube videos. Um, it comes out of the box supporting a couple things and it has extensions to support about 15 other video services. Uh, but what this means is it'll validate what someone throws in there to make sure that it's actually a YouTube video and it's properly embeddable. And it will handle everything from, um, from Flash to iframe to, uh, to HTML5 embedding uh, of this video in the proper format for the proper devices. Uh, without me having to write any code. Um, so um, that adds the video field. I can go back into the interface and then choose where that video field appears when someone is creating a project or editing a project. I can also drag it up and down for the viewing of a project. If I want the video at the very top, I can have it there. If I want it at the bottom, I can have it there, all configured through the GUI. Um, uh, it got a little more complicated when we started wanting to accept payments on things, uh, but we started with the same approach where we looked for something where we could add it to the perks. And in the case of the payment module, it provides something called payment field, which allows you to add a payment item to a, uh, an existing content type in a way that's very lightweight. Um, payment is also used by the commerce module for more complicated things. But payment module, if you just want someone to be able to buy one thing, that's, that's really all you need. Uh, commerce module adds in things like shopping carts and order tracking and shipping and all sorts of other things that we didn't really necessarily want to track for someone just signing up for a perk. Because a lot of these perks are delivered digitally anyway. And a lot of people come to the site and buy one perk and then they leave. It's not usually the usual that you would go through multiple um, projects on Kickstarter in a row and sign up for multiple perks at a time. You could on this, but it wouldn't be through a shopping cart. Uh, so. Um, the thing that got challenging here is that um, uh, payment requires currency for doing conversion rates and supporting the different currencies of the world, and currency requires some composer-based modules. How many of you have worked with Composer? Okay, so like about five to 10% of the people in here. Um, 
Composer has um, a complex relationship with Drupal 8, and I think this was one of the weaker spots that we ran into with this build. Because since Currency has some Composer dependencies, uh, neither Drush installing them nor uh, installing them through Drupal's own GUI would handle pulling in the dependencies, which mean, meant we had to figure out a way to pull in the Composer dependencies. Uh, there are various things that have happened in the ecosystem for this, but we're, we still see the anti-pattern that we saw before uh, with um, there being different solutions being offered in Contrib at different points in the life cycle of Drupal, where, like for example, there's Composer Manager, which can do the job, but even the author of Composer Manager doesn't think it's really the right way to handle Composer dependencies. So uh, for at least this build, we decided to go pretty lightweight, and we basically just pulled up the composer.json file for currency, uh, and you can find out that something has Composer dependencies by either trying to install it and noticing that it complains that it can't install yet, uh, or looking for a composer.json file in the modules directory. Uh, in this case, so we, we uh, cat um, to display that file, and it turns out it has two external dependencies, which are um, commerce currency and commerce currency exchange, uh, both penned to the 1.x series. So we can take that. Um, I still have the bottom of that file on, at the top of here just to see that. And we can do composer require and then add those dependencies, which will add them to the composer.json for the basic project in the, um, for Drupal. Uh, this can complicate uh, some core updates. So uh, uh, we're looking for better ways of doing that. And this is kind of part of the call to action side of this stuff of figuring out how this should work for Drupal 8. Uh, but it does do the right thing. It pulls down the dependencies. Uh, and um, we added one more option here that might be useful to you, especially if you are deploying to servers and working on your desktop, which is the ignore platform rex uh, option, which basically says to Composer, even if I can't run these, um, these Composer projects locally, that's okay. Like, a lot of Composer projects are looking for things like PHP extensions or versions of PHP that you may not have on your desktop, and there's no reason you actually have to have them on your desktop to install those uh, dependencies and commit them to something like Git. Uh, so we got those, we downloaded them, we committed them to Git, we pushed them back up to the server, and then we could install the, the, uh, the, the modules. Um, so um, th from there, we added the payment form field to perks. Uh, the payment form field allows um, listing uh, doing an item listing, a total, and having a big button to basically say pay for this. And then uh, from there, we basically configured it where it would be in the most basic mode possible, uh, where uh, it would just um, provide a single button for payment with no other real options. Uh, and then in terms of how users actually create their perks, uh, what we did is we hid a lot of the fields you would usually use for nodes because perks don't really need their own URLs. Um, and uh, in this case, um, we didn't want any of the other fields in terms of authorship, et cetera. Those aren't that important for, um, for tracking there. It might be nice to have internally, but not for display. And then uh, for the payment form, importantly, we changed it to a drop-down selection list. Uh, versus the normal view, which allows you to put as many line items as you want on it, because by its very nature, a perk is one line item. Uh, so this means that users get a pretty simple form for creating them. Um, so here's what we see in terms of the final project form. Um, we have, uh, fortunately, the resolution of this kind of mingles a little bit, but uh, you have the title, you have the preview, which is the YouTube link for the video, you have uh, the body, um, and then you have the risks section, and we've made the risks section required so that people have to publish some risks of them getting the project done successfully. And this is all being delivered in a way where it will render with the video, with, um, it has um, WYSIWYG for editing both the risks and the body content for it. Um, and uh, this gets associated with the user in a way where, where they can add perks to it later. And then the final perk form um, has the title, it has the body to describe, describe uh, what the perks are that come with that package. And then down at the bottom, you can see that you can select a currency and put an amount. Um, the, uh, there's a little bit on here that um, we probably wouldn't, we would have liked to have a little simpler, uh, but you can put the currency, you can put the amount, you can put the quantity, um, and uh, you can put a description for how that line item appears when someone actually goes to checkout. 
And then uh, at the very bottom, you actually see the project thing for uh, the, uh, the reference for, that does the auto lookup. So all I have to do is start typing in my space, and then it pulls up my project. I can select that, and then that creates a perk for my project. Um, and then the final view of uh, a project view before we actually added in any kind of theming uh, is that you can now pull up a project. You can see um, that it embeds the video properly. It shows the description. It shows the risks. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you actually see the first perk that we created, which is um, uh, um, my new perk. And it, you can see the description that it has. Uh, and you can see a little bit more cruft than we would have liked uh, for um, the perk in the sense that you actually see a sort of uh, as if it's a, an order with one item in it. Um, but this is just kind of emphasizing what direction we would see going forward with uh, theming on Drupal 8. Because traditionally in Drupal 7 and before, the way you would theme things is you would send a sort of kind of node ID or something very lightweight to the theme layer. And then the theme layer would often make a bunch of API calls to find all the data that it wanted to actually render. Uh, and then that meant you had to work with a lot of PHP in the theme area. Uh, the nice thing about this mode here is that uh, this data that you see going in the perk view is what's getting handed to the theme layer. And now all, that, all that's required is editing a twig template and removing the information that we don't want to render. So before, you would send a tiny bit of information to the theme layer and make a bunch of API calls. Now what we'd recommend for Drupal 8 is send at least what you need in the theme layer and then trim it down from there. And that makes a much more, much clearer development path of how the data gets rendered in that twig template. It doesn't require you to work with any PHP in, in the, in the uh, theming layer. Um, and uh, it means that you can deliver this sort of functionality without uh, any PHP at all, at least that's written by you. So, uh, we, um, with that, um, we will open the floor to, uh, to questions, um, which is the basic, I guess, closing statement of like, if you're building new projects on Drupal, give Drupal 8 a shot and give just the, core, the vanilla core a shot uh, to see how far you can get with that before you uh, dive into contrib. And then also, of course, dive into contrib before you start writing your own custom PHP. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. and how would you do it if you wanted to use a, something like an entity instead of a node, since given that maybe there Nodes are entities. entities. Oh, but yes. I mean, but like a more stripped down version so that you didn't have to have all that extra stuff. That, that I don't know if there's a way to do that quite in the GUI. Okay. Um, the, uh, I'm not, I wouldn't, I would admit that I'm not an expert quite in that area. But I will say that uh, one thing about all the steps that we took is that you can export the configuration of all of that with configuration management in Drupal 8 and manage it safely. And then also um, for the, the nodes, um, you do still have the ability to, uh, to alter things in Drupal and provide um, uh, changed renderings if you need to simplify things beyond what you can do in the GUI. Cool, thanks. Awesome, other than that, thank you so much for attending our talk and we hope everybody have a fantastic DrupalCon New Orleans. <laughs>